What's the best diet for hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's? What should I be eating? Now, some of you may be new here, but in my previous podcast, I got to interview a lot of different experts, doctors, nutritionists, people from all areas of health and wellness, and they all had their own thumbprint for this topic. But there were some common core principles of thyroid healthy eating. A thyroid healthy diet is gut healthy, it's anti-inflammatory, it's nutrient dense, and ultimately it's really personalized to you. And how do we get to that personalized, bio-individual, perfect thyroid diet for us as individuals? That's what we're going to boil down today and talk about. There's a lot of pathways for getting there, and I think that's where we can get really confused. So which diet is right for you? Where should you begin? And that's what I'm here to help you figure out today. Hello, thyroid drivers. Welcome back to another episode of Thyroid Healthy Bites, a weekly podcast dedicated to helping you live well and eat well so you can feel well. I'm Ginny Mahar, your host and the face behind the apron at hypothyroidchef.com. So in the last episode, we covered thyroid healthy eating. What is it? What does that mean? And we sorted out some of the conflicting advice around thyroid healthy eating and identified those common threads that most experts agree on. So if you missed that, be sure to check out episode five, what is thyroid healthy eating? Diet isn't the only element of a thyroid healthy lifestyle. I think we can fixate on that. It really isn't just one thing, it's all the things. It's how we manage stress, it's how we sleep, it's how we eat, yes. It's also, are our supplements optimized? Is our medication optimized? There's lots of different factors here going on. So diet is not the only element, but it is a very essential and foundational element of thyroid healthy lifestyle. And when it comes to thyroid health, I think a real common source of confusion and overwhelm and frustration is that there is no one size fits all diet. As we mentioned before, you know, there's those common core concepts of anti-inflammatory, gut healing, nutrient dense and personalized eating. And there's a lot of dietary templates that make good starting points for people. And that's where so many experts decide to focus on one specific diet, whether that's paleo or the autoimmune protocol, or you have to go gluten-free, all thyroid patients have to go gluten-free. I mean, those are the areas where the experts can really differ in their opinions. But we're gonna cover each of those dietary templates today as starting points, because they do make good um, containers, sort of. They do make that good first stepping stone for getting you started and getting you on your way. And some of those stepping stones are small, and some of them are really big and they each have pros and cons, so we're gonna cover all of those. Ultimately, I'll say it again, in the long run, the best diet for you is the one that is personalized for you. It takes a bio-individual or a personalized approach and it recognizes your unique sensitivities, your genetic makeup, your lifestyle factors, your life circumstances, even your personality. Because you can tell someone that they have to do a strict elimination diet like the autoimmune protocol, but a lot of people are gonna struggle to stick with that long term. And if you can't stick with your thyroid healthy diet, you're not gonna reap the benefits. That's sort of the bottom line. So all those factors that make you, you come into play here. Just to recap a little bit from the last episode of Thyroid Healthy Bites, the process begins with those common core recommendations, avoiding inflammatory and problematic foods for the gut, incorporating more nutrient dense whole foods that support gut health, thyroid function, and overall health. And ultimately, this whole process starts with a process of dietary elimination for a period of time, removing those problematic foods for at least a month and up to several months, sometimes years, where we facilitate gut healing through our diets. 
And throughout that process, we're also really trying to develop an ear for the feedback our bodies give us. How do we feel when we eliminate gluten or dairy or sugar in our diets, for example? We've got to learn to listen to our bodies. And many of us simply don't do that. We ignore it. We override it. We've been taught not to listen. We've been taught to basically eat junk and then take a pill for every ill to mask these symptoms that our crappy processed food diets create in our bodies. It's really messed up. And it, but this is, you know, kind of the reality we live in. And if we're not careful, if we're not motivated to take the reins of our health and feel better, we can end up stuck in this place of why don't I feel good? I'm, you know, doing what everybody else is doing, what's the problem? So there's so many ways to get to where you feel better, you feel optimal, you feel like the food you're eating is supporting your vitality, it's giving you that healthy glow, it's making you feel good from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, and ultimately it can help lower your thyroid symptoms. It can even help lower thyroid antibodies for those of us, the vast majority of us, who have Hashimoto's or autoimmune hypothyroidism. So I think of it as a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, you have like just going gluten-free. Now, gluten is the number one dietary recommendation for thyroid patients to eliminate or you know, of just avoid gluten. Maybe you just start with that. And then over time you experiment with eliminating dairy and then maybe you tackle sugar and then maybe you start looking at your caffeine consumption or alcohol and on and on. You can take that, you know, smaller stepping stone approach. And that's what I call the baby step approach or the micro step approach. And here's what I like about that approach. First of all, it's more sustainable. This is uh, goes back to positive psychology and the psychology of successful habit change and sustainable habit change. When we take smaller steps, they're more sustainable. They don't overwhelm our nervous system. They don't send us into a fight or flight response. And our bodies have a little bit easier time assimilating those smaller steps we take that, we get there, it becomes our new normal, we get to a point where it doesn't take so much effort anymore, and then we take another small step, and we keep building and building and building and building on that, and those small steps can get us really, really far. I, I like that this also takes a growth mindset. It's not about, I'm just gonna do this diet for 30 days or a month, or I'm just gonna do this to lose 20 pounds or whatever. It's, this is the long run. This is the rest of your life. This is how do you wanna eat for good? What do you want your new eating normal to be so that you promote and protect your health your longevity, and that you feel well and more symptom-free. The baby step approach also enables you to meet you where you are. Are you a busy mom who has five kids at home and you've got a job and, 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 and it's just like too overwhelming to think about something like embarking on a full-blown elimination diet? You know, I think the smaller baby step approach can be helpful depending on where you're at with your life circumstances if you're in a really overwhelmed place maybe you're in maybe you're in school maybe you've got something else huge going on maybe you're going through a divorce i mean who knows we're all you know pushing our wheelbarrow through life filled with our circumstances and we're at different seasons of life we have different goals we're at different places with our health. Some of us are in a more critical place and some of us are in a place where it's like, yeah, I feel okay, but I could feel better. So all those things um, factor into your ultimate decision. The downside of the baby step approach is that it can take longer to achieve those big gut healing and symptom reducing returns that you want. So this might not be right for you if you're in the midst of a more serious thyroid and autoimmune related health crisis. On the other end of the dietary spectrum, you've got 
a full elimination diet like AIP. The autoimmune protocol, this is also sometimes called autoimmune paleo, or the elimination provocation diet, which is a little bit different, but it's very similar, kind of basic same idea. And this is where you eat a very restricted diet for a period of time. You eliminate all the possible inflammatory foods and problematic foods. And then one by one, you systematically reintroduce them to determine which foods work for you and which don't. Now, this elimination diet approach is still considered the gold standard for identifying your dietary intolerances and sensitivities. It's super powerful. I've used sort of a mixture of both on my healing journey thus far. Um, I've done several rounds of the autoimmune protocol. My general approach, if I can, is more of a baby step. Okay, I'm really working on my caffeine now or whatever it is. So the thing to remember with these elimination diets is that the long-term goal is reintroduction of foods. This is one of the main pitfalls people fall into where they get stuck in the elimination phase. They feel really good in the elimination phase, you know, less bloating, less inflammation, less fatigue, all this stuff. They're like, oh, here's my diet. Well, these elimination elimination phase um, of the autoimmune protocol or an elimination provocation diet is really meant as a means to an end. And that end is hopefully successful reintroduction of as many foods as you can reincorporate. What I really like about the elimination diet approach, we'll go into pros and cons here, is that I think it's got a greater poten potential for profound healing returns. Um, like we talked about, if you are in a serious health crisis, which you should, if you are, you should absolutely speak to your doctor about that and make a plan that's right for you. But if that's where you are, you know, something a little bit more um, focused and concentrated like this may help you get farther faster. So if you're at a place where you're like, I cannot function like this, you may want to consider something like uh, an elimination diet approach. Um, the downside of this is of the elimination diet overall is just that it's very restrictive, especially the elimination phase. Um, the autoimmune protocol can be a lifestyle or a lifelong diet once you've gone through the reintroduction phases. But when you're in that elimination phase, it can be really hard on like your social life, on your mental health. Some people find that they have a hard time reintroducing foods and get stuck in that elimination phase long term. Some people find that they become afraid of food and disordered eating like orthorexia is one of the real risks of diets like the autoimmune protocol. So when we're embarking on those, we have to remember to stay grounded in our ultimate goal of reintroduction. Um, and it can be really great here to have professional help from a holistic, integrative, or functional nutritionist along the way. There's some awesome autoimmune protocol certified coaches out there. If you're looking for someone to help you like that, I know several people, feel free to reach out to me. Um, regardless of which end of the spectrum, you know, these are the two extremes and we'll cover kind of the middle steps too and get more, you know, dialed in on each of those diets as well. But regardless of what end of the spectrum you're on, whether it's baby steps or full elimination diet or something in between, this process takes time. Just gonna be real with you, this takes time. This is a marathon, not a sprint. And as mentioned, there's several ways to reach that ultimate goal of your personalized thyroid healthy diet. So that's what we're about to dive into. What are those um, dietary templates that can help you get there? How do they differ? Um, how can you maybe start thinking about which one might be right for you? Before we go any further, I have to add this disclaimer. I am not a doctor, not a dietitian, not a nutritionist. I am a thyroid patient advocate and health coach. 
and I am here to inform you and educate you. This is for informational and educational purposes only. And I highly encourage you to reach out to a functional, holistic, or integrative healthcare professional to get some support in this. Um, my naturopath has helped me immensely with the dietary changes I've made in helping me make sure that not only do I make them successfully, not only am I supported with the right supplements along the way, but we're also looking at things like, am I getting the right nutrition that I need when I'm eliminating these other foods and things like that. So these are complex issues and it's really important that you t speak with your healthcare practitioner before you make any major dietary changes. Okay, so to continue on this path of informing and educating and hopefully inspiring you to think about like what, what comes next for me, what feels right for me what should i talk to my my naturopath or my functional nutritionist about or whoever you're working with if you're feeling overwhelmed by even thinking about that just remember that optimizing what you eat is truly hands down one of the most empowering and game-changing aspects of your thyroid journey and ultimately your lifelong health you know, when you think about your big why, whether it's wanting to be around for your grandkids or be more active as a mom or enjoy your retirement more or just feel better and be able to pursue your dreams, whatever that big why is for you, this is like a requirement for getting there. So have some faith in that and have some faith in yourself and your ability to do this in a way that works for you. It doesn't all have to be done at once. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. I'm here to help with that. I have tons of resources for you guys on hypothyroidchef.com. So deep breaths. You got this. And also just another, you know, little carrot here is to remember that, well, there is no single, you know, dietary protocol that can guarantee you're going to reverse your diagnosis. When you implement these dietary changes, the vast majority of people experience a reduction in symptoms. So think of these dietary levels that we're going to talk about as stepping stones on the path of getting to know your body's unique needs and triggers. And the goal is that you eventually find that customized diet that's tailored to your specific needs. It can be fluid, it can be flexible as you continue to learn about your body and adapt as it changes and as you go into new seasons of life. So this is doable. I love it. It's become such a source of joy to me and to my family to really share this with them. Like, let's think about how we eat and how it makes us feel. These are really powerful conversations to have with your kids, with your loved ones. So um, you're worth it. Before we go head first into all the foods that we're supposed to avoid and eat less of as thyroid patients, let's take a moment to focus on all the foods we can eat. Cause I know, I know I am a food lover, I am a chef, I love to eat, and I know it can feel like a really huge bummer to think about giving up foods you love. But trust me when I say that a thyroid healthy diet can be really delicious, colorful, diverse, amazing. So that's why I put together a free one page download for you. It's called the Thyroid Thrivers Grocery Guide. I'll put the link in the show notes or you can grab that at hypothyroidchef.com slash grocery. Okay, so there's a lot of foods that a lot of experts talk about avoiding for thyroid patients. And all of these, we're not going to spend too much time on them because really this is a whole other show. But all of these can contribute to things like leaky gut, inflammation, autoimmune disease, hormonal imbalances, um, not just thyroid hormones, but you know beyond. What we're just going to do a quick overview. Top of the list, gluten. After that, dairy, soy, sugar, grains, industrially refined oils, caffeine, 
alcohol, and just processed foods in general. The goal is a nutrient-dense whole foods diet that's primarily gonna be based on three things. Clean animal protein, lots of organic produce, and healthy fats. And there's so many delicious ways to combine so many delicious ingredients that fall into those three categories that I promise when you make this your new normal, you won't feel like you're missing out all the time. Diving into the dietary levels, step one, this is that, you know, one end of the spectrum is just going gluten-free. Now, the big thing with gluten and the reason why it's such a common recommendation from experts to eliminate is something called molecular mimicry or biomimicry. We covered this a little bit in the last episode, so I won't dwell on it too much, but essentially gluten can contribute to leaky gut. The gluten molecules escape the intestinal barrier. They go into the body. This launches an immune response from the body. The body identifies this invader. This isn't supposed to be, you know, we're not supposed to have gluten floating around outside the digestive tract. The body attacks it. Well, the gluten molecule and the thyroid molecule are very similar in structure, and so the body can become confused. And this is where Hashimoto's can really come into play here, where the body starts to produce um, anti-thyroid antibodies as kind of like a ripple effect of that gluten getting into the body. Um, so gluten is found in anything containing wheat products, barley, rye, semolina, spelt. It's hiding in a lot of foods under tricky names like hydrolyzed vegetable protein or modified food starch. It's in soy sauce, strangely. Um, when you see like traditional soy sauce, it's typically made primarily with wheat. One of the pitfalls of trying the gluten-free diet is to avoid replacing gluten with gluten-free junk food or just these like processed gluten-free foods. We're not trying to replace all the, you know, waffles and breads and pancakes and things like that with just gluten-free versions. We really want to focus on those clean animal proteins, organic produce, and healthy fats instead of just making those replacements across the board. Although those replacements can be really helpful in just helping us have more dietary flexibility, helping us feel like we're not missing out. I always have a loaf of gluten-free bread in my freezer. I don't use it much, but once in a while, I really want something like a piece of avocado toast. And so I have those things on hand. Most thyroid patients are going to experience a, a reduction in symptoms from eliminating gluten. Um, our holistic nutritionist for my previous website, she eliminated gluten 100% very strictly. She learned all the places where it's hiding. She was very careful with what she ate and she was able to make a complete recovery um, from doing that. Most experts agree that reducing gluten isn't going to work. So, you know, as Adrienne Klein, our holistic nutritionist, um, also expressed in sharing her own story, she really wasn't able to get the reduction in symptoms from just reducing gluten. And this is a common question. Can I just eat less of it? A lot of people say, I feel better with less. I don't feel that I need to eliminate it completely. And, you know, I'm not here to tell you what to do, but I can share with you what the experts say, which is the reason so many of them encourage us to completely eliminate gluten 100% is that it can kick off this inflammatory response in the body or this autoimmune response in the body that can last for months, even from a little tiny bit of gluten. That is kind of the tricky thing with eliminating gluten and why I think a lot of people choose it as this is gonna be my focus or my hard line or my first stepping stone is I'm just going to really try a strict 100% gluten-free diet for a period of time and see how that feels. The pros and cons of the gluten-free diet approach are that it enables you to start small and that increases your chances of success. 
just like we talked about before. You're more likely to stick with smaller habit changes if you're able to make them in those smaller steps, depending on your circumstances. I think gluten-free is a really livable approach. There's so many gluten-free options at restaurants now. There's so many gluten-free recipes and blogs. All of the recipes on Hypothyroid Chef are gluten-free. Um, personally, this is my hard line. When I travel and I know I'm going to really just need to have a little more dietary flexibility than I give myself at home, Gluten is my hard line. I just really try to avoid it 100%. The cons of going gluten-free is just that gluten is hiding in so many foods and goes under so many of those funky names. So you have to really like educate yourself. There's lots of apps about this and tons of online resources about you know all the different names that gluten goes by. And you do over time, you just, you educate yourself and you learn, oh, yep, no, I gotta be careful with that. I need to use this product instead of that or that brand won't work. You know, it does get easier as time goes on. The other kind of con of taking the gluten-free approach is just that it can have a limited potential for healing if you're only cutting out gluten and you're still eating a bunch of sugar and a bunch of processed foods and a bunch of other inflammatory foods. Um, it's something, but you know, maybe a little more would be better. So after that, take in another little stepping stone. You can take the gluten-free, dairy-free approach. This is really common and also, this is like 99% of my recipes on hypothyroidchef.com are gluten-free, dairy-free. Um, I also cater to a lot of the other diets, but this is like as a baseline, what are the guidelines for my recipe? Gluten-free, dairy-free. Once in a while, I might include a little tiny bit of cheese and always with some notes about what kind of cheese might work for you and, and substitutions if you're absolutely dairy-free. So pros and cons. Gluten-free, dairy-free, I think is another quite livable approach my experience, yep, I feel better eliminating dairy. And I've also been able to reintroduce a little bit of certain kinds of dairy. I can tolerate aged raw milk cheeses, like a little bit of true Parmesan Reggiano or Asiago Stravecchio, things like that. Those raw milk aged cheeses are so broken down. It's kind of like, um, when you think about yogurt or fermented foods, that like fermentation process breaks down the dairy proteins, makes them a little easier to digest. Also, I think what helps me with being able to occasionally incorporate a little bit of those types of cheeses is that they're strong and you're only using a small amount. It's not like this everything covered in gobs of melted cheese approach with you know something like Parmesan, just a little sprinkle, it's like a garnish. So um, that's just my personal you know discoveries I've made over time, over years, with the help of my naturopath and nutritionists I've worked with. Hey, maybe you know some people find that this works or that works. So that is nice to have that little bit of wiggle room, but yeah, something like a glass of cow's milk, a milkshake, cottage cheese, no, no way. Joint pain, bloating, it's, I just know it's not worth it for me. It sort of sends my body into too much of an inflammatory response. So that's been my experience with dairy. Okay, taking another stepping stone. You can just continue to expand on this. Uh, maybe you start with gluten-free, then you go dairy-free, then you go gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free. Maybe also sugar-free. So I'm not gonna cover each of those you know, specifically, but you can build on these layer by layer. We're going down the spectrum to get you know, a, ultimately a super clean, really nourishing, delicious diet. And as you take those small stepping stones, you sort of learn along the way, like eliminating dairy was hard for me. I love cheese. I used to work as a cheesemonger in my 20s. I just, life with zero cheese was hard. So it's been really nice to find, oh, raw milk cheeses, especially aged ones, I can tolerate a little better. I can tolerate a little bit of goat cheese here and there. I can do that because 
I've tested that and experimented and have noticed, does my body go into like a long-term inflammatory response from this or not? Okay, now we're gonna go into the other half of the spectrum, not all the way to the end. We're gonna talk about the paleo diet. The paleo diet eliminates these foods, gluten, dairy, soy, sugar, like talked about all those already, also eliminates grains, legumes, which is beans and peanuts, processed oils and artificial ingredients. Pros and cons of the paleo approach. This can be a challenge to dine out with because there's a lot of hidden gluten and soy, but it's relatively easy to find paleo recipes, to cook paleo, to shop for paleo because there's so many resources out there. There's so many people, especially autoimmune patients, I feel, who have found, wow, this is really making a difference with my symptoms. I know several people, not just Hashimoto's patients or Graves patients, but people who have dealt with things like MS, rheumatoid arthritis, who have made major, amazing, miraculous improvements in their health by going paleo. With paleo, you're really dialing up that potential for gut healing and more profound symptom reduction or even antibodies reduction. Most of the recipes on Hypothyroid Chef are not just gluten-free and dairy-free, they're also paleo compliant. So that's like, the vast majority of my recipes. Again, with paleo, you can eventually reintroduce foods like gluten-free grains or a little bit of dairy. And unlike the autoimmune protocol, you can have things like nightshades, nuts, eggs. This gives you a lot more wiggle room just as far as what you can eat, like coming up with breakfast and things like that seem to not be quite so much of a challenge on paleo as opposed to the autoimmune protocol or AIP. And that's what we're gonna talk about for our last dietary template is the autoimmune protocol, the mother of all elimination diets and the gold standard for reducing or eliminating dietary inflammation. So the autoimmune protocol eliminates all gluten, all dairy, legumes, nightshades, which is tomatoes, eggplant, potatoes, sweet and hot peppers, cayenne, red pepper, goji berries, spices derived from peppers like chili flakes or paprika. So all nightshades are out on AIP. Eggs are out. All nuts are out. All seeds are out, including seed spices like coriander or caraway. It also eliminates all the processed and artificial and refined sweeteners and ingredients and oils and all that processed stuff is totally out on the autoimmune protocol. So pros and cons. AIP can be one of the most restrictive diets, but it also carries the most potential for really profound healing, especially gut healing. The systematic reintroductions are then done in phases after you have this like strict elimination phase that happens for at least a month, most would say at least six weeks or more, sometimes months, sometimes years. And then you go through the phase one through four of reintroductions. And those phases are really laid out. You know, a lot of people just wanna go back to the foods that they missed eating the most. But what the autoimmune protocol reintroduction stages do is lay those foods out in order of which foods you're most likely to be able to successfully reintroduce and reincorporate. But even within each reintroduction phase, each food is reintroduced one at a time. So we're looking at a process that takes time and it takes a real investment of time and effort on the front end. On the back end though, you've got this personalized bio-individual diet and you've really done some intensive gut healing and hopefully symptom reduction. So you're really going for it with AIP and I think some really profound things can happen and they can happen maybe 
like ultimately faster than taking the baby step approach that can happen over years and just, you know, like peeling the layers of the onion back with AIP, you're more like, you're just gonna, you're gonna grab the whole onion and devour it and just get her done all at once. And then go through that time consuming reintroduction um, process. But ultimately on the other side of that, maybe in six months, maybe in a year, I'd, however long it takes for you is really what it come, the timeline comes down to. Whenever you get to that point, like you've got your bio individual diet, you've tried eliminating all these things and reintroducing them. And along the way, you've really tuned in, you've listened to your body and you've learned, what does this do to me? What does that do to me? Now I know. So it's always this like work in progress, right? But ultimately, if you're you know wanting to make major headway, buckle down, focus, and get her done, I think the autoimmune protocol can be really amazing for that. Several of the recipes on Hypothyroid Chef are also autoimmune protocol friendly. So, and I make that really clear at the top of each recipe. Um, my experience with the elimination phase of the autoimmune protocol is it's what I turn to when I've started to backslide and I need to hit the reset button. I really think of my overall diet as a personalized AIP or, or a personalized paleo, um, where I've gone through those eliminations and the reintroductions. But I have done several rounds of elimination phase AIP as a reset. That has seemed to work really well for me when I've needed to recover from, say, a gut dysbiosis or different things that have popped up over the years as a Hashimoto's patient and just throughout my thyroid healing journey. Um, the longest I've done on elimination phase AIP was six months. And this is when I was doing an intensive gut healing protocol with the help of my naturopath. And honestly, it's, it's mentally and emotionally kind of hard. I find when I'm doing it, I don't want to socialize as much because there's so many temptations. I don't want to go out as much because it's too frustrating. What is there on the menu that I can safely order? But I have used it from time to time as a very effective tool. I believe in it and I believe that it really can be an effective means to an end. So there you have it. Those are the most common dietary templates that thyroid thrivers use to reach their healing goals, to reduce symptoms and feel better. They make great starting points. They give us a common language of, oh, I'm on AIP or I'm on paleo. Okay, well, here you go. Here's what you need for recipes. They make it easier to search for recipes and menu plan and things like that. And they also can open that door to learning what those bio individual needs are. So which spot on the dietary spectrum is right for you right now? And that really depends on so many factors. Are you in a highly compromised state of health with your thyroid or autoimmune issues? Do you have support at home? How are your cooking skills? Are you cooking for just yourself or are you cooking for a family? Are you cooking for small children? How much time do you have to spend preparing food? What feels like the best next step for you? I think this is a great thing to journal about, really do some soul searching about what resonates, what feels right in your gut. Talk to your healthcare provider about, you know, maybe some changes you're thinking about making and make a plan and start as small or as big as you need to, wherever on that spectrum is right for you. And then just keep going. Just one little step after another and you will get there. I am living proof. If, if trust me, if I can do this, so can you. I mean, I couldn't even begin to wrap my head around making all these dietary eliminations and changes when I started out. And now it's like, Oh my gosh, this is so much the way I want to eat because I know my body. I've learned to listen. I've learned to 
treat myself as a temple so that I can feel well, I've learned that that isn't just about me. That's about my family. It's about you and me being here and having the energy and the wherewithal to do this with you and to share this and to follow my dreams of trying to make a positive difference. I mean, that it's no smaller than that. That is the power of our food choices. And I think it really is highlighted and magnified in a big way as thyroid patients. These things make a huge difference. I ran Thyroid 30 for several years and I saw people go through this process in the way that they chose, what several of them did, the autoimmune protocol or paleo. Most of them just started with gluten-free and every season I would see the most miraculous personal not just discoveries, but um, victories, big and small. You know, people getting their lives, their energy back, reducing skin issues, digestive issues, all kinds of stuff. So there's, there is effort involved, but there's major rewards to be gained. And I think it is a worthwhile experiment. It's a worthwhile area to research and to learn more about. And I hope this has helped you start that process. Or maybe you've already been in this process for years. If so, share with us. Let us know what's worked for you. What have you really found is your, say, dietary hardline or what dietary approach has worked for you? Have you been autoimmune protocol for the last five years? Are you only gluten-free and you feel pretty much good and that's good enough for you? Like, where are you at? Because we all benefit from sharing with each other as a community and sharing our experience of what has worked for us, what hasn't, and what has gotten us the results that we're looking for. And from there, Finally, always remember that, you know, after that, the best next step is to go to your functional or holistic healthcare practitioner and collaborate with them on this decision. Get that professional support so that you're getting the nutrition that you need and you're set up for success and to get those results. When I did that intensive six month gut healing protocol with my naturopath, we came up with a plan at the first appointment. I remember it was around this time of year, it was in early December, and she said, do not start this right now. We're not gonna start this before the holidays. You'll just set yourself up for frustration. We're gonna start after the holidays are over. I was in a place with my health where I did need to make some changes and do some intensive healing, yes, but was a few weeks gonna make that much of a difference for me? No, I was I was pretty functional. So that was the decision that we made together. And that was really good advice on my naturopath's part to wait until after the new year and to set myself up for success that way, not trying to do this through the holidays. And it also gave me time to plan and prepare myself emotionally, you know, to really wrap my head around what I was doing and why, to write about it, to think about it, to envision myself succeeding at this and and to set that goal. That's something that just works for me. Okay, I'm gonna go six months, I'm doing this and I'm gonna reap the rewards from this. And I did, I had some test results after that that were like, beyond my wildest dreams and it was worth it. But that time to prepare also gave me time to let my family know what was coming. Hey, after the new year, I'm gonna be doing this. So, you know, maybe not the best time to take on something really stressful or to go on a big vacation or something like that. It even gave me time to start batch cooking and putting up freezer meals that were compliant with my dietary plan. So set yourself up for success. That's a big, no matter what approach you're taking, give yourself the tools you need to succeed. Give yourself the time, give yourself whatever it is that is going to make this more likely that you can stick with this, do this successfully and get the results. That might include professional support. It could include recipes that you and your family will love, wink, wink. It could include finding resources like, you know, ordering that new cookbook or whatever it is. 
I think one of the best resources to start out with is my free Thyroid Thrivers Grocery Guide. This is an awesome one-page download you can grab that's got over 130 delicious foods we can eat. And it's gonna really help get your wheels turning about what thyroid healthy meals might look like for you long-term. It'll help you envision that success. So if you haven't already, please download my grocery guide. I'll put the link in the show notes. You can also download it at hypothyroidchef.com slash grocery. Okay, Thyroid Thrivers, thank you so much for watching. I so appreciate you being here, commenting, being a part of this awesome community, and for just taking the time to educate yourself and start getting inspired about which dietary level is right for you. If you've enjoyed the show, please don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a review. This show is really in its infancy and you taking that extra second to support my work, like it really does help so much. So thank you in advance. I'm Ginny Mahar wishing you the best of health. I'll see you next time.